Next talk by Shai Frati. Uh, the title is, the lecture is about hyperbaric oxygen induced late neuroplasticity in post stroke and TBI patients. I'm going to ask you over there with the slide an unusual question. Uh, can you bring up the previous presentation and put the last slide on before I'm going to mine? I haven't saw the presentation before. This is the first time that I see it, but it goes together. Not the last, the one before. Don't count my time. It's still on the hell time, okay? The, the one before the last. You have two minutes. <laughs> no, 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 not mine, not mine. Go to, not my previous presentation. The last presentation presented now by Esther. Before, 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 beautiful picture, but look at this. <laughs> look at this. Look, let's see what we are looking over here. There is a huge cascade of things that are going in the metabolic pathway, but look what happens over here. What we see over here, impaired cerebral vasoregulation, reduced cerebral blood flow, and hypoxia ischemia. Okay? This is the basic. Everything lie on that. Now I can go to my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> the, the cannabinoids are potent vasorelaxants. Yeah. And they inhibit the endothelial vasoconstriction. And we have shown it in human brain. So this okay. And we haven't spoke about are it before. Cannabis? We haven't <laughs> spoke about it before. This is the first time that I see our presentation. Okay. I will speak about hyperbaric therapy, and here hyperbaric therapy is actually an oxygen. And I will look at the brain a little bit different than what was shown before. We will look at the brain as a thermodynamic system. And my great teacher, which is Alex, is sitting over here. And the one that translates to me everything that Alex says, which I don't understand, is Orna that sits also over here. So we will start with a thermodynamic view. Okay, let's look at the system as a thermodynamic view. The brain, 2% of the body weight. However, it takes 50% of the cardiac output, 20% of the overall oxygen consumption, and 25 to 30% of the overall glucose consumption. Meaning, if it was a system, a device, electricity, the total energy consumption of the brain is around 20% if the total run is 80 watt, okay, watt. 20 watt out of 80 watt, something that is so small that's it over here. It's amazing when you come to think about it. These are facts. The PO2 is in the blood around 90 to 100. The cerebral but however, in the brain, in the cerebral venous circulation, it's below 35. More than that, it's a continuous. There are areas in the brain when the PO2 is much lower, meaning the brain is living under hypoxic condition. Okay? If we are looking at the brain, at each time point, 5 to 10% of the brain is being active each moment. And only 5 to 10%. Why is that? This is my little girl that you saw yesterday. She always say, why? You tell her something, she asks why, and again why, and again why. Okay, why, why is a very difficult question. Why only 5 to 10% of the brain is being activated? The reason for that is we don't have energy for more. And what the brain is actually doing is transforming blood from one location to the other. If we are activating the hand, then I'm probably thinking less, okay? so. The translation of the blood will be to the motor area. And going back or forward like that. Even when we sleep, if we're dreaming, same 10%, not more than that. Brain metabolism, only fact now. The brain metabolism is aerobic. Why is it aerobic? Because we want from each glucose to generate 38 ATP and not only 6 ATP. We need the energy. What happened in the post angel band, we have just heard. I think that most modern 
treatment in neurology, especially after stroke, is being gained after this article written by Astrup, which speak about the penumbra, the stun brain, hibernating. They are more or less synonymous. What we see in this area is that we have enough energy to keep the membrane potential alive, but we don't have the energy we need for the action potential. It's a dormant area. From the metabolic point of view, this area is almost dead, in a coma, okay? We can see those area now by using SPECT. And Golan over here will, is responsible for the SPECT we see in this uh, patient. And what we see now, we know that this area can consist for months or even years after the acute injury. From the metabolic point of view, in this area we see that first of all there is an anaerobic metabolism, like we saw in the slide before, and this generates all the things that we see over here. There is a high level of intracellular calcium, and there is a BBB damage get, that can induce the inflammation. Again, the BBB damage, one of the main triggers for that is the continuous ischemia of the area. Let's think about hyperbaric oxygen in the post-injured brain. Again, it's oxygen, amount of oxygen. We can learn a lot from study that have been done on patients with severe traumatic brain injury. Why we are learning from that? Because in this patient, there were holes in the brains and all over, and you can measure what happened inside. This is very interesting study that took patients with severe traumatic brain injury and exposed them to standard air, oxygen 100% at one atmosphere, and oxygen in hyperbaric exposure. We can see, and the brain PO2 consumption and the brain PO2 concentration was measured. We see that when we are increasing the oxygen, of course, in the CNS, the brain is also increased. When we are giving hyperbaric oxygen, it's not only that it increases, it consists for hours after we end in the therapy. Does the brain need it? Is it a limiting factor? Does the oxygen is a limiting factor? For that, we have to check the metabolism. If it's a limiting factor, once we are giving oxygen, the metabolism will be increased. And here we can see the metabolism in the brain. We can see that if we are giving normal baric, the metabolism is still the same. Oxygen at room, pressure the same, but when we are giving hyperbaric oxygen, look what happened. It looks like the brain was waiting for the energy. Once we are giving the energy, everything is being turned on. Look what happened from the metabolic point of view. Oxygen do all of that. Of course, increasing the tissue oxygenation, the deformity of the red blood cell, which bring more oxygen to the area. In general, we are correcting the impaired between the delivery of O2 to the tissue and the need of the oxygen in the tissue. There are many preclinical studies, most of them, that evaluate the effect of oxygen on different metabolic cellular inflammation effect. And each research that focus on a specific Something, for example, the BBB say, oh, I found it. The hyperbaric oxygen improved the BBB. Other one is playing with the anti-inflammatory effect. Okay, I give in oxygen, it has anti-inflammatory effect. This is the reason, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's not like this. We are giving energy. <laughs> now, each research sit on different part of the elephant and said that's it. But this is energy. It's an elephant. We are giving energy. And that's what caused all the changes. Many people ask, and especially from thermodynamic point of view, if the metabolism is changing from anaerobic to aerobic metabolism, like what happened when we are giving hyperbaric oxygen, and by turning to aerobic metabolism, we are using better the oxygen for, uh, for generating energy, why does the body doesn't do it by itself? Why it doesn't happen? And the reason for that is metabolic well. Everything in nature, when we want to change something, we have to bypass a metabolic well. That's a rule in nature. For example, if we have a car that sends up the hill, okay? 
The car should go down. It shouldn't stay up the hill. But you need to give it a push. You need the initiate energy to give the push, and then the car is going down. And that's what happened over here. That's what we are doing with the oxygen. We are giving the energy that takes the system out, take it out of the metabolic well. When we have thought about starting a clinical study with hyperbaric oxygen, the timing is very important. Some say that timing is everything, and I have, again, I haven't heard the lecture before. This is the first time that I'm hearing that, okay? Looking from the thermodynamic point of view, there are three stages for everything that happened. We have the acute event, a degenerative process that happened afterwards, and then we have a regenerative process where the system recover. The NMDA is a classical example. Again, I gain several minutes because I don't have to explain it. What happened to the acute, the phase, and again, I agree that the main reason for a failure in the clinical trial was the inability to find the acute event, not like rat and mice and preclinical study where can you give the treatment in a certain time, humans are more complicated, okay, until they are coming to the ER, going out, everything is more flexible. Another example is the GNK pathway and other that, and I can give more example where timing is everything. So if we are bringing energy to the system, when do we want to give the energy? Is it at the acute event? Probably yes. If we will give it at the acute event when the ischemic is triggered, then we will get a benefit, a good benefit. But can we give the treatment immediately in humans? Probably not. Probably not. We definitely don't want to give hyperbaric treatment during the degenerative process. We are giving more fire, more energy to the fire at this stage. We can and want to give more energy to the system during the regenerative process. And this is where we aim in our research. Of course, in humans, it's very complicated to know where you are, okay, when you have patients. Let's look at the clinical trials. With respect to CVA or stroke patient, there were several clinical trials with different results about the hyperbaric effect. All of them were aiming for the acute event. And when we are aiming to the acute event, the time after the acute event was between zero to three days initiating the treatment. So the results are very conflicting. And again, I believe it's time. We have conducted during the last four years two clinical trials in our hospital. One of them is for post-stroke patient, and the other one is for patient after acute traumatic brain injury. In both of these studies, we have initiated treatment on the chronic late phase for two reasons. One of them is that we didn't want to add energy during the, the degenerative process, and the other one is practical reason. We didn't want that the control group will improve. So we will have a sample, a sample size that will be uh, smaller. All patients, different studies, all patients had chronic neurological deficiency. Before we have, before going into the control of the treatment group, all patients had anatomical evaluation of the brain, which is CT, metabolic evaluation of the brain, which is SPECT, and neurological and neurocognitive evaluation. The neurological evaluation is specifically important for the stroke patient, and the neurocognitive evaluation for the traumatic brain injury patient. After that, patients were given either hyperbaric oxygen therapy, 40 session, or were in the control group where they receive no treatment, which is very important. In many clinical trials, 1.3 uh, atmosphere consider as placebo. This is not placebo. It increased the oxygen in the tissue by more than 50%. This is a dose effect, okay? So at the beginning, before going into dosing, we didn't want to give any treatment. After that, a second evaluation, and then the control group has received the treatment. It's actually a cross of the control group to receive the treatment in order to get some compensation for the lack of placebo. 